Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Brian Hayes. Brian joined Now CFO in 2014 and serves as the CFO. Brian has experience in working on multi-state law firms, engineering firms, nonprofit accounting, construction job costing, loan mortgage servicing, and preparing year-end audits. Brian attended the University of Phoenix in Phoenix, Arizona, and obtained his Associate of Accounting, then continued to Colorado Technical University in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and obtained his Bachelor of Science in Accounting, as well as his MBA in Finance. In his free time, Brian loves to hunt, fish, camp, read, barbecue, and spend time with his family. Prior to joining Now CFO, Brian worked in small manufacturing, job costing, import-export from Brazil and the Philippines, product sales price modeling, inventory management across multiple states, small business and personal tax returns preparation, and financial statements. He worked for a pest control company for 10 years and was licensed in California in all three branches. Brian has also been an owner of a business which provided bookkeeping services. Brian, thank you very much for being my guest today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Megan. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, today we're going to be discussing your journey to the C-suite at Now CFO, as well as some of the insights you've collected along the way. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about you and your organization. So let's get started. First, if you could just tell us your career journey, how it is that you got to where you are today? Uh, You know, I've actually had a very non-conventional or unconventional career path. Um, More and more common these days. Yeah, yeah. Mine is interesting because I I spent nearly 10 years in the pest control industry in Southern California first. Um, I actually ran a structural fumigation division for most of that time. And um, it was a career path I thought I'd stay on for a long time, but uh, when the um, housing market uh, crashed in 07 and 08, that really devastated that industry, and it forced me to really rethink what I wanted to do with my life, and that's actually when I decided to go to college. Um, I was already 30 years old, and um, I already had a family of four kids and was working, obviously, and so we decided that uh, college was the right thing to do, so I actually started doing online college. Um, did that for five years straight. Wow. Um, we actually uh, added a, another kid during that time. So we have five kids now and uh, made a move to Utah from San Diego. Um, we kind of got tired of paying for the weather in Southern California. It was pretty expensive. So <laughs> moved out here for a job. Uh, kind of crazy because then I got laid off three months later because they're, they're having financial issues. And so <clears throat> Being uh, new to the area, not having many connections, I thought that was a great opportunity to to start my own business. <laughs> so I, I started my own little bookkeeping and tax practice. Um, I worked with an uncle of mine in Idaho Falls to get some more experience and started picking up a few clients. And uh, it never got really big, but eventually one of those clients hired me to come in as their controller and operations manager. They were uh, importing acai and other fruit products from Brazil and South America and other places around the world to the U.S. And it was a great, fun, fun job. We really learned a lot and uh, helped them through a merger and purchasing a, a large fruit processing facility in Brazil. And then um, worked for a couple smaller companies for a time, doing both controllership and operations management. And in 2014, I ended up here at now CFO. Uh, originally as a consultant, I thought it'd be a short-term stay, and then I maybe go off and do my own thing again, but really ended up loving it. I, I worked with some awesome clients right off the bat. Um, I was lucky enough to work with a couple different Habitat for Humanity affiliates here in Utah, which was really fun. And uh, about a year later, the opportunity came out to be a partner and to relocate to San Antonio, Texas, and that's what we decided to do. So we Sold our home here in Utah, moved out to San Antonio, and I was out there for about two years and got our San Antonio and Austin markets off the ground. And um, after that, you know, family situation needed us to come back to Utah. So we came back here and uh, ended up taking over 
uh, the Utah market and became a regional partner and helped out running our Idaho offices and then offices down in Las Vegas and Phoenix as well. And uh, so we did that for a couple of years. And just last year, the opportunity came up to come in house as the CFO for now CFO, which was something I never really thought about doing, but our CEO, Randy Christensen called me. He's like, what do you think? And, uh, you know, it felt right. So I, I came on, on board here in house as a CFO, and I've really enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun, kind of taking all my experience in operations and, and running our practices and helping grow practices and mentor other people to come in and bring some of that to uh, our corporate team. So it's been very non conventional or unconventional, but it's it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds like it's been a great adventure. <laughs> so, did you study accounting as an undergrad? Yeah, I actually. I got my bachelor's in accounting, and then I also did an MBA in finance. Okay. How did you choose accounting? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, my, in my naive mind, I thought, one, accountants are always in demand. It's true. And two, they're, they're never going to have to work in a lot of extra hours because there's never an accounting emergency. That was my naive thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, this would be great. And I did have two uncles that had done different things in accounting. The one that, like I mentioned earlier, was had his own practice. And then another one had been in accounting and private industry and also for some banks. And so I just thought, man, that was really cool and it might be fun to do something like that. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Um, yeah, your your first idea was right. Your second, not not so correct. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so as you look back on your career, and you might have already touched on this, but are there like turning points or stories that stand out in your mind is like really sh- having shaped your career? You know, it, it's, I've been thinking about this a little bit now as I'm getting older. And I think one of them is that decision to go to college when I was 30. Uh, I think it would have been really easy to just kind of do what I was doing, be, be in management and sales or different things like that. And uh, no one else in my family had ever gone to college before. My, my dad had enlisted in the Marine Corps and uh, my mom had just uh, worked a little bit like in home hospice. So this was something very different for my family and, and myself. So I went ahead and did it. And I remember I was really proud of a project I'd worked on with my undergraduate. And I was trying to show my dad about it and talk to him about it. And he said, this is just a waste of time, Brian. You need to just go get a job. You know, he'd end up at UPS after he uh, got out of the Marine Corps and spent almost 30 years there. And he just was like, you need to go work at UPS, get a job there, let him take care of you, you'll be fine. And that really uh, got my hackles up a little bit. I was like, that's not cool. I I'm, I'm, was really upset about that. And so it made me dig in more <laughs> and work harder. And uh, it's got me to where I'm at to now. And it's funny because my dad's really changed his perspective. He's really said, okay, you know what? That was a really good decision on your part. And it's just opened up so many opportunities for me and given me a lot of confidence to just go, you know what? I can do whatever I set my mind to. And uh, it's been a game changer, honestly, for me. Yeah, that's awesome. That was a a brave decision, especially with, you know, four kids already at home and um, making a, a change like that is never easy. Yeah, my my wife was basically a single mom for five years while wow. I was in school and working. And so I got to give her a lot of credit. She did a lot of the hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk about your current organization, um, Now CFO. What exactly is it that, that they do? So Now CFO, we are an outsourced accounting and finance firm. So we provide controllers, CFOs, uh, even staff accountants um, on site generally with our clients. COVID obviously changed that up a bit, but uh, we we work on site with our clients as much as possible on an hourly as needed basis. So we hire consultants who a lot of them have come out of the CPA world, had a lot of experience maybe in private industry and want to do consulting as, as their career. And so we've grown from 2015 or 2005, when we were founded here in Utah, uh, to now we're in about 40 different cities across the U.S. Almost 400 employees, company wide, and um, you know we've just been growing and, and trying to help our, our clients and our, our networking partners and our employees to just achieve the things that they want to do. So it's a lot of fun. It's very gratifying to come in and help an organization 
to maybe get the extra help that they need for a short, short-term or even long-term basis and um, help them to really continue to grow. And who is your ideal client? The ideal client is typically a company that's growing, uh, has some account, uh, some pains in the accounting department, uh, or finance department. Um, just they're, they're maybe had their friend or family member doing the accounting for a while, and now they're they're above uh, un- underwater. You know, don't know exactly what to do, and they need the extra help. You help them through a transaction or raising some debt or equity, different things like that. Uh, or even controller services. We see a lot of uh, work in the controller space with our clients just to bring that technical accounting skill to, to help them with their financial reporting. We we do a lot of cleanup and, and organizational work with companies to help them have better, more efficient accounting. So we, we work with typically companies that are all sizes. Um, I'd say most of them are under that 50 million in revenue mark, but we do have a lot that are even Fortune 500 companies as well. And you've done a lot of things since you've been with them. So what are your proudest achievements since joining? And you said you joined in 2014? Yeah, yeah, I joined in 2014. I kind of feel like um, I'm kind of to take a step back. Our founder, Jim Bennett, actually talks about this a lot. He wants to create lift in people's lives. You know, that means helping our employees, our, our clients, our networking partners, and uh, I feel like I have embodied that philosophy and um, I'm kind of the poster child for that, where, you know, you can start out as a consultant, you can grow into just about any position in the company, or you can actually succeed and, and do the things that you want to do. And I feel like that's uh, something fun for me to do and is an example to everybody else here and what they can accomplish. So it, it's maybe kind of intangible, but it, it really feels like it's it's a a lot of benefit for everyone else just to kind of be there. A lot of pressure, obviously, too, being the CFO to a bunch of other CFOs that run markets. But, um, you know, it's it's a lot of fun. Sounds like a great place to work. Yeah, I've really enjoyed my time here. It, it's a lot of fun. Don't plan to do anything else. So what has your transition into the CFO position been like? You know, it was it's different um, than I expected. I... You know, I've been running markets and practices. We've got about, uh, like I said, 40 markets across the U.S. and each is run by like a partner or market president. And I was helping run several of those markets. And going from being the market leader, you know, hiring and training our consultants and managing a sales team to coming in-house and kind of having to go back into the accounting and the numbers and the actual financial reporting was a little bit different. And I had I had been out of it for a little while. So I had to reteach myself a little bit. But the, the nice thing was I really understand our business and I, I knew what, what the operational side of it was. And so it was really good for me to just start marrying up my accounting skills again to that financial reporting side and helping to continue to help grow in uh, practices. So nowadays it's it's a lot of fun because I can just, um, I'm kind of the liaison between the markets and our corporate office here in Utah because I've been on both sides now. I've experienced them both. And I feel like I've been able to bridge a gap uh, between you know, what's going on in the market and teaching that to our corporate people here, you know, who are trying to serve those markets and also working with our partners in the markets to get the help that they need from our corporate staff. And so it's that bridge uh, that really was the big transformation for me. Yeah, that's awesome. I, it's true. I mean, you've come up through the organization, so it, you definitely know the operations. And these days, I think it's so important for successful CFOs to really understand how the business operates. Yeah, it seems like CFOs more and more doing more on the operational side of things as well. It's not just the numbers. It's really focusing on how, what do the numbers do to help us understand the operations and how can we make the operations run better? And and that's what I see happening a lot in the CFO space. And now CFO adopts a roll up your sleeves approach to financial consulting. So what exactly does this entail? Well, it really starts from the first touch point with our clients. We um, we've always done a we try to be in person and on site with our clients as much as possible, including you know in the initial analysis meeting we do a whiteboard session with our clients. And we really try to get to know them, their business, 
uh, the people that are involved. Um, we, we whiteboard this all out. We look at what's really working for the company, what's not, and then what are the solutions that they really need so we can create a roadmap for them to get to where they need to go. And from there, we, we uh, work on site as much as we can. Um, our model up until COVID was we're on site, we're there with you, your people. Uh, we're not there to tell your people what to do and, and come in and just do that analysis. We actually will do the work. We're very hands-on. So we can get into that general ledger and, and do the cleanup. We'll do the balance sheet reconciliations. We'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty and um, not just sit back and expect you to do it all. We're there to help you and guide you as much or as little as you want us to. And so from that process, we really learn a lot about our clients. Uh, we try to be very transparent. We actually have developed a, uh, a project management software that not only tracks the time that we're working on our clients, but the, the projects and the status of those projects. So they can log in any time and see what we're doing for them. And they, they always can get that update anytime they want. And they've got a dedicated consultant that's there, or even a group of consultants there working with them. And so it's, it's very customized to their needs. It's very customized to their, their budget as well. Uh, we, we work on an hourly basis, you know, without a long-term contract. So our clients, you know, we feel like for our clients, we have to earn our keep every hour that we're working for them. And that's the focus that we have to try and give them that hands-on, roll up our sleeves approach to helping them succeed. How, just curious, how how have the last two years been for your company? You know, uh, it could have been really, really bad for us. You know, when COVID first started, um, we, we kind of were a little bit flat foot, caught flat footed like many people mm -hmm. because we're so relationship based. We have salespeople who are, you know, used to being at networking events and being in front of our clients and consultants on site. And so we actually took an approach where we said, you know what, let's, let's try something different. And we adopted the Zoom platform, basically. And uh, we started doing these whiteboards via Zoom and uh, really upgraded our technology, better cameras, microphones, even TV, so we could see the person we we're talking to, you know, almost full size. And I think it really helped us to focus in on doing a better job in that process and better communicating and better understanding and deep diving into what the client's needs are. And we've actually grown significantly in the last two years. Um, we added another 25% growth in 2021 alone. 2020 was uh, still a growth year. It wasn't as big, but uh, we're still experiencing that growth right now. Things are still moving forward very quickly. Yeah, that's great. So talk to me about the importance of financial visibility and like, what are the steps that a business leader can take to get or better gain visibility into their company's financial performance? I think the first thing that really needs to happen is just making sure that your data is accurate. You know, working with your team to, to make sure that they're trained and they have the right tools to do the job correctly so that the information you have is, is as accurate as possible. Automation, I think, plays a big part into that. As much as you can automate, uh, you'll be in a much better position uh, so that you can actually focus on the data and you're not so worried about doing the work. And from there, uh, it's creating the systems that will um, allow you to see the data. And a lot of ERPs are great because they, they bring a lot of this information together, but if you have a lot of different systems, it becomes harder to aggregate that data. Uh, we ran into that as we were growing. We actually... Uh, started developing uh, a data warehouse for ourselves that would aggregate data from our accounting systems, our applicant tracking systems, our payroll systems, um, our, our uh, CRM, and a couple different places. And from there, we, we adopted Power BI to be the data visualization platform for this. And it's been phenomenal because now we can... I can start looking at gross margin by client and by the consultant that's working on that. I can put out the financials on a daily basis to our, our markets. Um, we can give them valuable insights into their sales and closing ratios and um, you know a, a lot of different things. But you've given us the, uh, the ability to really deep dive in to what's going on faster and see trends sooner to allow us to make pivots faster and make better decisions. And so 
really just making sure that the data is accurate and finding ways that are going to work within your system to pull that data. For us, again, it was that data warehouse and Power BI. Um, we actually even created another company to just do that for other companies because we found it so successful. Yeah, I was going to ask you if, if you do that for your clients as well. Yeah, yeah. We actually created another company called Devfinity that really does that for our clients. Um, we've got a great, great team there that can come in and do customized, you know, not only just software development, but really that data visualization. Uh, we've got a, a very large um, electrical contractor here in the state of Utah that we've been working with for several months. And they just keep coming back and going, what else can you give us? What else can we see? What, what else can we get? And it's, it's just been a game changer for them. They're a large, large contractor and they're, and they have a wonderful ERP and all this stuff, but they just couldn't get the data visualization that we're able to provide them. Yeah. So much data available these days, but it's really knowing how to use that data. That's important. Right. Right. <laughs> So you guys obviously improve a lot of accounting processes for your clients. Um, what can CFOs be doing right now to improve upon their accounting processes and financial reporting? Um, a lot of it, I think, is looking for you know, opportunities to understand the new technologies that are coming out, staying up to date with training, making sure even your teams have training um, so that with as much turnover as a lot of companies have seen recently with the great resignation and things like that, finding people, it's hard to, to, uh, to find ways to attract people, but training and development in your people, but even the CFOs uh, are, are so critical, spending that time learning, uh, investing in the systems that are going to make your work more efficient, easier. Again, going back to automation, uh, CFOs really need to start understanding not just the financials, but also how can we automate? There's more technology involved and really kind of being the person who understands all aspects of the business so that they can create value across, across the board. And a lot of that is going to be involved with technology nowadays, even AI, machine learning, uh, again, automation systems that'll help you to speed up the process of your, your closes and your financial reporting and getting data to people. I think we've got more people that are data hungry nowadays in business. And so we've got to be the aggregator of all that knowledge and be able to disseminate it without giving too much or you know putting the information out that's not accurate. We really got to vet that. So you, you just brought it up, but the great resignation... Um obviously affecting a lot of businesses right now and especially accounting. Um, how, how are you guys attracting and retaining talent? Yeah, um, we've, we've started doing a lot more remote work, which is something our consultants have really appreciated. Mm -hmm. Many of our clients really like it too, because we're able to give them uh, a better uh, variety of resources. So if we've got a client in Seattle who needs some specialty healthcare experience. And I've got somebody in Austin who's got that experience. I can marry them up. That's true. So, yeah. And we've got clients now who are comfortable with remote work. Our consultants love it because they're actually getting more projects or they can do more diverse projects uh, than just what's in the local area. And um, so giving them interesting work, a little more freedom has been really helpful. We've created different uh, compensation plans for our consultants you know, not just hourly, but you know, and, or a full-time salary, but kind of a hybrid between, you know, a, a salary that's at a, based on 30 hours a week so that they can maintain benefits, but still have some flexibility in their life. Uh, so we want our consultants to be able to have that balance. We, we try not to make it a situation where our consultants have to work 70, 80 hours a week. They've been in the CPA world. They've done that. Yeah. We try to focus on a 40, 45, maybe 50 hour work week if that's what they want and um, giving them just their life back a little bit more. Uh, same here for our corporate office. We've got a lot of people here on our you know, call center, our marketing team, accounting, legal, everything. And so we've been looking at ways to create a hybrid work environment that will allow them to serve our markets, uh, but also be able to get their work done. And it seems to be uh, very successful and very helpful. So, yeah, seems like you guys are doing some cool stuff. Yeah, we're trying. It's hard, right? Because yeah. there's... There's so many people that want different things and, you know, compensation is not even the most critical thing anymore. It's, it's just that flexibility that people want in, in their life. And uh, that's what we're trying to offer. Yeah. I mean, COVID 
you know, not been fun in any way for the last two years. But I do think some very cool things have come out of the situation we've been put into, like the fact that we can work from anywhere and geography is no no longer as important. Right, right. I, I remember uh, it was probably in mid-2020, I was listening to a podcast and I, I can't remember who it was that was speaking, but it was a, a CEO of a private equity group that had a large portfolio of companies. And, you know, with COVID going on, everybody was frantic about, hey, you know, what are we going to do to get through this? How are we going to get through and, and just survive? And the comment he made was, we, we don't need to figure out how to survive. We actually need to figure out how we can build our business to succeed in the current environment. And, and that's the attitude I think a lot of business owners, if they adopt it, it may be finding answers that they don't like, but it's the answers that will help them continue to grow and, and move through this so that they can succeed in the future. Because I think our economy and the dynamics have just really changed quite a bit. Yeah, I guess we've all learned resilience and adaptability over the last few years. <laughs> yeah. So you have a choice. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you touched on Power BI. Are there any other tools or technologies that you guys are using right now that it's helping to make your lives easier? Uh, yeah, Power BI has been great for our data visualization. And admittedly, we probably uh, stretched it beyond what it was maybe originally capable of. Uh, but the other thing that we've done is we've developed a software called BizView, which is, uh, I think I mentioned before, it's a project management software that allows us to create our projects and tasks and create visibility for our clients to see what we're working on. So it doesn't just track our time. It actually will allow us to collaborate and work with our clients, allows our consultants to uh, be very transparent in the work that they're doing and the progress they're making with their clients. Uh, we can actually track the progress by, um, you know, there's percentages that we can assign to each thing so the clients can see where we're at um, and, and just collaborate, share tools, share uh, um, files, even communicate through that as well. That's been really helpful because now our clients, you know, you know, everybody hates that phantom lawyer bill that they get and they wonder, man, I got all these hours, what's that for? And we wanted to take that away from our clients too because it's, with accounting, it's sometimes hard to see the tangible uh, work. And so by putting this together, it's allowed us to show our clients, this is what we're working on. We're working towards the goals that you've, you've established. And um, it's created that visibility they need to know that they can count on us to stay on track. And what advice do you have for CFOs who are looking to drive strategic value to grow revenue and margin uh, at their organization? It really, it's looking at the details. Uh, and we've talked a lot about data and that's, I think, been one of the greatest tools for me is just as a CFO to drive the value for our revenue growth. You know, I can look at things like what are our margins by customer even? And are, are we being successful in, in managing those margins? I can give those tools to our, our market leaders to, to make better decisions or we can collaborate on and discuss. Uh, but it's really getting into those details and then providing coaching and leadership to the rest of your teams and the people you're responsible for. Uh, we've got a lot of newer markets and newer salespeople and um, a lot of new people on our accounting staff here at corporates so that I can, I got to work with them and help them to be the best that they can be because that will trickle up to everybody else. Actually, it doesn't necessarily trickle down, it trickles up. Um, and as, as we're able to provide the, the training to our people that they need to, to achieve their goals and to provide that information and data and, and be able to get into the details with our, with our teams, um, we can actually have meaningful conversations. We can make better decisions and we can use those as coaching and teaching moments for those that we work with. And that's really a large part of the CFO role as I see it. Yeah, that's great advice. So lastly, as a CFO, um, as you look into the future, both the near term and the long term, what are you seeing on the horizon that's keeping you up at night? Well, there's the obvious thing with, with inflation being at a 40-year high. You know, that, that doesn't seem like it's going away. I'm, I'm not 100% confident that the Fed's going to come down with a, a soft landing with that. And, and really, that's my big concern going forward is, this inflation, you know, the Fed's going to do what they need to do to get things under control. But, you know, next year, the next 12, 18 months, what's that mean? And that's what worries me is just if we're going to run into a situation where we're into a big recession or not. 
Um, how's the inflation going to affect not just us, but our clients and the economy as a whole? Um, so it's it's not necessarily what's happening this week or this month. It's really what's happening in the next 12 to 18 months that makes me wonder. And what it's, it's what I'm focusing on to try and think about how can we be ahead of that? What are the indicators to help us to stay ahead of the changes that are coming? Yeah, it seems like just from one challenge to the next these days. I was hoping <laughs> for like a normal summer or something. But uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like normal is going to happen anytime soon. No, I don't I don't know. I, I hate that term, the new normal or the new norm. Um, just yeah. because it sounds like things aren't going to be as good as they once were. Yeah, I think in many ways it'll be better. I do too. I think we've seen that already. And a lot of it just depends on your attitude going into it. You know, you can you can make a, a good situation out of anything if, if you look for it, right? So, or at least make it better. Yeah, definitely a silver lining in, in everything. Yep, that's true. So Brian, thank you so much for being my guest today. Well, thank you for having me, Megan. This has been a pleasure and I really appreciate you uh, putting this together for us. Yeah, I really enjoyed speaking with you and hearing about your experiences and all of the resulting insights. And I wish you and now CFO all the best. It sounds like you're both doing great things. And to all of our listeners, please tune in next week. And until then, take care. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personiv. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personiv.com. Thanks for listening.